Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all of our witnesses today. I, I just want to say at the top that I'm really grateful to all the women and men out there who are weak working now to keep our country safe, and I hope you pass it along to all of your teams as well. Mr. Chairman, this is really a frightening time. At least six people in my home state have already died from the virus. I am told we should expect more. We expect the number of infections to continue to grow. And the people across my state, and I'm sure across the nation, are really scared. I'm hearing from people who are sick, who want to get tested, are not being told where to go. I'm hearing that even when people do get tested, and it's very few so far, the results are taking way longer to get back to them. The administration has had months to prepare for this, and it's unacceptable that people in my state and nationwide can't even get an answer as to whether or not they are infected. To put it simply, if someone at the White House or in this administration is actually in charge of responding to the coronavirus, it would be news to anybody in my state, and I've been on the phone with all of our local officials for days now. This is unacceptable. We are now seeing community transmission of this virus. Families deserve to know and fast when testing will actually be ready to scale up what they, the families, should be doing, and most importantly, what we are doing. And unfortunately, I have to say that while I am profoundly grateful for the work public health officials are doing, I'm very frustrated at the uh, steps the President has taken from repeatedly contradicting experts' advice to downplaying the seriousness of this threat and to appointing a politician to lead the response. So I'm really glad today, Mr. Chairman, that we have the opportunity to hear today directly from the experts and get answers to the questions that I am hearing at home. I know people uh, want answered, and one of those is, when are we going to scale up this testing, especially now that we are beginning to see community transition in the United States? After all, it's only after a long, frustrating delay that we are finally able to start testing patients for this disease at state labs across this country. And the last few days seem to confirm what experts have been warning that this is likely to continue spreading. We now have more than 100 cases of coronavirus that have been tested in this country, including repatriated cases. Well, there's a lot we are still learning um, there are a few things that are abundantly clear about how we need to respond. First of all, we do need to be listening to the experts and making sure facts and science drive our response. In particular, the public needs to be able to trust the information they're hearing from experts in the federal government is in no way influenced by political considerations or ideology, and that the policies being put in place are based on evident, evidence about how to keep our families safe not fear or prejudice. I was very heartened to hear your assurances, Dr. Fauci, uh, that contrary to reporting, you've not been muzzled by the administration. It is essential that that continue to be the case. We cannot have an effective response without accurate information and transparency from the administration, and I will continue to be very focused on this. Secondly, we've got to provide adequate resources to meet the needs of our federal, state, and local health officials because we know resources that come through programs like CDC's Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program are absolutely critical, but also were never envisioned to be sufficient to respond to a threat like this. So we have a lot more to do. Congress, as you know, is now working on a bipartisan emergency supplemental funding agreement that will reimburse our state and local public health officials for costs they've already incurred combating coronavirus and provide additional resources to our communities. It will guarantee resources are available to respond to outbreak hotspots. It will support development of vaccines and therapeutics to prevent and treat this virus and invest in <clears throat> public and global health programs to keep us re prepared to respond to future emergencies. I do want to thank and recognize all the Democrats and Republicans who came together to work quickly on this package, and I urge the Senate to pass it very quickly. I'm very glad we're working on that agreement that goes well beyond what President Trump's um, inadequate request for $1.25 billion in new funding. And, uh, and I really, again, urge the Senate to take this up as soon as the House does, get it passed and get it to our local communities who are dealing with this. I'm also very encouraged by this committee's strong bipartisan record in responding to public, public health emergencies as well. 
Just last year, this committee strengthened and reauthorized the law underpinning so many of the federal efforts and resources we are seeing employed today. So I especially want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for our work together, Senator Casey and Burr, uh, for their efforts on that. Third, we have got to be sure we aren't just responding to the latest developments, by st but staying ahead of this crisis by planning ahead, because this is not likely going to end anytime soon. We are already seeing some of the challenges that will come next, like the strain this will put on our health care system. We're seeing that in Washington State. We need to make sure our hospitals have the capacity to address this virus without overwhelming their ability to provide other care that people need. We need to make sure that those health care workers caring for coronavirus patients are safe from infections themselves, including by making sure we have a sufficient supply of protective equipment. We need to manage our nation's drug and medical device supply, especially considering uh, we expect demand for some supplies and are already seeing that to skyrocket. And how many drugs and devices are manufactured in countries where an outbreak could interrupt production, something that we again are already seeing. We also need to give adequate attention to our public health education. In an age where disinformation has been weaponized and falsehoods and rumors gain traction, as we all know, faster than ever, we can't let conspiracies stoke panic or spur ugly discrimination or spread dangerous misinformation or undermine our public health experts. We need to actively take steps to prevent and respond to bullying and harassment that is motivated by stereotypes and fear. And we also have to account now for the ways that some of the harmful health care policies have undermined our ability to respond to public health threats. Our uninsured rate is going up again for the first time in years. Junk plans, which are not requ required to cover diagnostic tests or vaccines, um, are expanding. And those actions make it much harder for people to get the care they need to keep this crisis under control. So we have to make sure that everyone who needs it has access to diagnostic test testing going forward. And while a vaccine is still likely over a year away, we need to make sure cost is not a barrier for that as well. But it's not just our health care system we need to be considering as we work to stay ahead of this disease. Communities and families right now are facing difficult decisions. What measures should our schools take to keep our students safe? What can parents do? When should schools close? Employers and workers in my state, and I'm sure others, will face, are facing similar questions about whether their employees should go to work or whether they should stay open. I will be pressing Secretary DeVos more later this week about how her department is helping to prepare for these issues, and I've written to Secretary Scalia about this as well. And is, uh, as so often the case, this public health threat will have hidden and higher costs for those who are low-wage workers, who don't have affordable childcare, who don't have health insurance, and who are experiencing homelessness. In my home state, people are being told to stay home for two weeks if they are sick. There are not tests, so they can't get tested. Guess who can't stay home if you don't have childcare, if you're a low-wage worker, if you don't have sick leave? When those people's basic needs are not met, they cannot um, make choices to protect themselves, which means they can't make choices that best protect others, too, because one person getting sick has repercussions for all of those around them. Situations like this remind us we are all a community in a very real sense. We all have a stake in one another's well-being. So when we talk about the impacts of this health threat, I want to be clear this is not just about changes in the stock market, but we also need to develop plans responsive to the day-to-day -day experience families actually have, and that is something I plan to raise today and will keep raising. I look forward today to hearing from all of our witnesses about how we can best prepare our communities, and I will continue to work with all of you and our health officials to keep families in my state and across the country informed about what they should be doing, what we are doing, and to keep them safe. And I'll keep um, pushing to make sure that the, as this situation continues to develop, we keep listening to the experts, providing our health officials the resources they need and planning for the long term. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.